Hey everyone, welcome to this episode of Compassion and Courage Conversations in Healthcare. I'm your host, Marcus Engel, and this is the podcast where I teach compassionate communications, inspire resilience, and provide perspective. Today, I am super excited about introducing you to Dr. Sharon Pappas. Sharon is the Chief Nurse Executive of Emory Health in Atlanta. She is a nurse extraordinaire, fantastic nursing leader. Uh, her list of accomplishments and degrees and academic pursuits uh, just make her one of the one of the most prolific nurses that I've had the opportunity to meet in my 20 years of being around healthcare. So, uh, Sharon, thank you so much for for being on with me today, and welcome to the show. Well, wow, glad to be here, Marcus, and you are one of my heroes as well to be able to listen to you talk about the importance of nurses and the importance of nursing compassion um, is always something that touches my heart and, and makes me very proud to be a nurse. So thank you for I, that. Well, yes, of course. And it, it makes me proud to be the recipient of that kind of care. So I love the synergistic way that uh, relationships grow and blossom across, across healthcare, but specifically in nursing. So I wanted to start, can you, can you just start at the beginning? Like, why did you become a nurse? Whatever inspired you to want to, to want to take on professional caregiving and then move on through leadership and where we are today? Sure. Well, well, you know, I've been a nurse now over 40 years, so this could be a long story, Marcus. It could take <laughs> up our entire time, but I'll try to call out some of the high points. Um, you know, first of all, um, I was a junior in high school, still kind of trying to figure out, you know, what in the world do I do that actually serves the world and, you know, makes makes it a better place like all of us wanted to do when we were in the in the late 60s, early 70s, you know, thinking about our careers. And, and, and my uh, grandpa, who lived with us uh, here in North Georgia, um, actually had to have a pacemaker uh, put in. And so... He had to come to Emory to do that, which is all making it very interesting now that I'm back here as the chief nurse. So we brought him to Emory. He got his pacemaker. Uh, we're sitting in his room. My mom and I are sitting in his room to take him home because uh, everything had gone well. And this woman walks in the door, white cap, white dress, white legs, white shoes. And she says, Mr. Tarpley, I want to teach you how to live with that pacemaker. And all of a sudden, it was just struck me that you bet I want to be part of a profession that teaches people how to live. And, and so, you know, I, I went back, I changed my whole senior year schedule um, uh, for high school to meet the requirements to apply to nursing school and, um, and was accepted to nursing school. My, my mother was a school teacher and she says, you will finish with a bachelor's degree. And so of course that limited my choices, but I was so glad that she gave me that guidance. And, um, and so I became a, a nurse after the next four years and uh, began my practice uh, here in Georgia um, in uh, pediatrics. And then that evolved into cardiology, which evolved into emergency nursing. So that's kind of how, how I got started in all this. But the emergency nursing part is very interesting because um, I found myself the nurse educator in a busy level one trauma center. And as that educator in that emergency department, I uh, had opportunity then uh, to get tapped on the shoulder after the nurse manager left. And uh, the, the leaders there for the hospital said, would you be the manager until we find someone? And of course I said, yes because you know that's what we do as nurses we want to serve and we want to we want to continue to learn and grow and so i took over that that nurse manager job and ended up being the permanent manager and i was so amazed at how it impacted me that i was now the the person the keeper of the culture so to speak um, to really create a great place for nurses to be happy healthy and doing what they love which means that they're doing, providing really great patient care. And so I worked really hard to, um, to make sure that we had a work environment that, that meant that nurses were being fulfilled in their job. They were able to be humans and practice um, a lot of humanism and compassion with the patients that they cared for. 
And um, I saw many of them move on to uh, leadership roles and return to school and, you know, advance themselves, which I thought was a fabulous uh, benefit to them as well. So that was my first foray into a formal leadership role. Uh, now, my little sisters would tell you I've always been uh, a, a manager because uh, I always told them what to do. Uh, but I would say that's probably not a leader. But uh, this was my first formal leader role as a nurse. And uh, I'll never forget it, um, all the things that I learned. And it stimulated me to go back to school. I got my master's in uh, nursing admin um, with a focus in finance. And it just prepared me so very well for the, the subsequent leader roles that I've had since then. So that's my so, story there, Marcus. That's a, thank you for for sharing that, and and that brings up the question. You know, you said you've had uh, forty plus years in this field. Obviously, the technology has changed. Obviously, uh, the things that we the medical advancements have changed. What in bedside caregiving do you see as one of the biggest changes over your career for for your typical staff nurse at the bedside? Yeah. Well, I had the very unique opportunity about five years ago uh, to watch my own daughter, who you recently met, mm -hmm. uh, to watch her enter the nursing profession. Um, she um, and, and I just kind of made it an exercise to say, OK, what's different between when she's entering the profession and when I entered the profession 40 years ago? And and boy, it was fun to do that because I got to really look at. Um, what I saw her loving and what I saw her or uh, her dreading and what I saw the same in myself. And, and a lot of it was the same. And, and I'm sorry to say that there were many things that she was doing that had not actually changed very much in the 40 years since I uh, was a wee nurse. But one of the things that I would say that was clearly different at the bedside was, um, was the use of technology. Um, you know, she, she's never charted in a paper chart, uh, just like I've never charted electronically. And so that was one big difference. And, and that may sound like just something, you know, pretty transactional, but actually, you know, the whole process of charting and the amount of charting that you have to do is tremendously changed because um, I remember, you know, actually just having to write down vital signs and initial quick assessment and then a sign off and anything in between there that was unusual. Um, I also had to, had to write down in a chart, uh, but boy, we've put a, put a large, uh, a large, I would say burden and, and um, accountability on nurses today uh, to, to actually have to enter a lot in the medical record. In fact, sometimes I refer to nurses as the data entry uh, people for the EMER, um, but you know, as long as you've got an electronic medical record that can can uh, give back to you after you do all the data entry, that makes it uh, somewhat worthwhile. But I would say that's one thing that's that's very very different uh, for us because I know that with the minimum requirements that I had back, you know, 40 years ago, I had a lot more time uh, to go from patient room to room to room and talk to patients and families and and you know really spend time uh in that human aspect of their care which now sometimes i think nurses are a bit challenged to do uh, which is really unfortunate because you know the compassion that nurses bring to their work really is an important uh, satisfier to nurses and and i hate that nurses are robbed of that because we provide so much data entry um, either meeting regulatory requirements or organizational requirements that are, are established. So, you know, that was that was one big aha for me when I compared then and now. Um, but um, I would also say um, I had to wear my cap uh, then, and she doesn't now. I don't think she even owned a cap from nursing school. Um, and I would also say, um, you know, just the overall um, um, accountability they have for more of the relationship-based care is very different. Uh, in terms of your patient experience. And, and so, you know, I encourage nurses to remember how important those relationships are to them because that's a lot of thing of what drives their own professional satisfaction and fulfillment is having those patient and colleague relationships and try to always preserve time to do that. So that's, that's some of my, my, my talk with the new nurses.
That's that's great. You know, whatever we are emphasizing, <clears throat> pardon me, the human being at the other end of the stethoscope in the bed and exactly. just how essential that that interaction, that relationship, that communication is. Uh, nurses obviously have such a um, an opportunity in those relationships to comfort the patient or potentially the opposite when that comfort is not there uh, to make that patient feel disregarded or alone. And and that that brings up another question, you know, the um, you know, the basis of everything I talk about is is presence. It's human presence. It's um, it's talking about compassion. How do we be compassionate in the moment? And one of the exercises that I do with my pre-meds, their, their first paper of the semester is when I ask them to to write about a time that they were there for somebody or that someone was there for them so that we can bring this back into a personal level and reconnect with that feeling of having someone care for us or being that person uh, caring for another. Now, you obviously have lots of clinical experience, but does uh, to, to draw from many experiences. But I always want to ask the question, can you share a story about a time that someone was there for you or that you were there for someone else? Yeah, I think so. this takes me back to my emergency nursing days. <clears throat> Excuse me. When um, we were in having a really, really busy afternoon and I got word um, through the front desk that there was a child in the waiting room uh, with a laceration that needed uh, suturing. And we just did not have an empty bed for that person. And um, I felt bad about that because, you know, I could imagine, you know, as a parent, you know, you're sitting there watching your child in pain and, and afraid. Um, and so I just took a minute uh, from what I was doing and I walked out into the waiting room and I sat down beside dad who had daughter in his lap. And, and I said, you know what, I don't have a bed right now, but it's not going to be long. I said, let me, let me look at your boo-boo. And so we, we looked at and her injury and I said you are going to be just fine and you just hang on and I'll come get you probably within about 15 minutes and so you know they were but they were both very quiet and I thought oh I don't think that did any good um, but you know eventually within 15 minutes you know we brought them to the back of the ER and took care of the laceration and and discharged them from the ER and of course they said thank you and and everything, and, and you you don't really realize what impact you have sometimes in the moment. And um, all of a sudden, I uh, a, a couple of weeks later, the administrator of the hospital walked down to the ER and asked to find me, and uh, shared with me a letter that that dad had written him about how I took time to come out and and uh, comfort his daughter and and you know give them some kind of idea about what what was coming next and that they wouldn't have to wait long and you know you just you just are doing your job um but you you don't realize um what what impact you have sometimes and what a little thing is a big thing to someone else and i always think about a an administrator that i worked for one of my one of my favorite bosses his name was dr randy hafner um and this was in colorado um he uh he had said he made a statement to us there in the hospital that um, our every day is a patient's once in a lifetime. Mm -hmm. and, and, you know, the things that are routine to us every day are, are certainly a once in a lifetime event for for others. And and um, and I think that that was that was something I'll never forget. And if I can tell another story, I'll tell yeah, you about maybe. a time um, more recently when my husband had to have um, have a valve replacement. And, um, you know, I'm the, I'm the spouse that's telling him goodbye to go to the OR. And then I'm sitting there and my sisters were coming to sit with me and, and, but they had not yet arrived. And I started getting uh, phone calls and sometimes it'd be a text. Sometimes it would be a phone call, but it, it was the nurse in the OR who knew how important it would be to me as another nurse to know when he was asleep, when the surgery started, how the surgery was going, you know, I mean, she did, she called me back like every 30 minutes 
just to give me an update. And, and you know, it might not be, there's been no change. They're still doing this or that. Um, but, you know, it was just a voice at the end of the phone uh, that I knew was there with my husband. It's an acknowledgement of how difficult it must be to be that family member yeah. uh, or spouse of a patient and that that OR nurse checking in with you. What a what a beautiful example of staying present, even if you're not physically located in right. the same you know, huggable distance. Yeah. Uh, what a beautiful story. What a beautiful how do you how do you convey that culture of compassion to your nurses? Especially especially in a CNE position, you have such a a great amount of power to to help set the expectations and the the goals for all of your staff. But that seems like an overwhelming task of trying to, uh, how do I say, trickle down effect to such a large group of, of individuals. How do you how do you do that? Well, <clears throat> well, I think there's no one master plan. Um, but what I will tell you is um, during the pandemic, Marcus, um, you know, a lot of there were a lot of people that left their offices and began working from home. And, um, you know, my office is not in a hospital. It's in a it's in another building. And uh, so it would have been OK for me to to have gone and worked from home. Um, and I did try it for a few days, but it just did not feel right to me to be at home when I knew the nurses were in the hospitals. And so I came to my office almost every day. Um, it was funny because sometimes they would turn the heat off in the building because they thought no one was in here and I'd, I'd be sitting here with my coat on. Uh, but, um, you know, finally we got that figured out. But I came into my office almost every day because I felt closer to the nurses, the Emory Healthcare nurses. And, um, you know, somehow that was just what I felt like I wanted to do, which kind of brings me to your question of, you know, how do I do that? Well, I think that you have to be present with every nurse that you encounter, you know, and, and I think that I always try to, to do that, to, to give them time and to not just be about, even when I have a meeting, to not just be about me going blah, 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 we're changing this, we're doing this, you know, it's, it's a meeting where we begin with a reflection that uh, connects people to their purpose. And by the way, I've used a few lines from your books uh, to do that. So thank you. Uh, but, you know, you begin with, with really connecting with who we are as people and who we are as nurses. And, um, you know, if I get an email from a nurse, I, I always try to respond. If I get a letter from them, you know, I always respond to that. You know, people, people deserve your response, even if you don't agree with them or if you don't have an answer to their question. Just the fact that you received it and you acknowledge it and you give them time to talk about, you know, what was on their mind. And, um, you know, as soon as I could, um, you know, with the pandemic, I, you know, put, put my lab coat on and my my dance goes and off or their sanitas because the dance goes fall off my feet. But um, <clears throat> get out there and you you walk around and you see people and you say thank you. And so I just I think the answer to that is it reminds me a little bit of the line that Gene Watson um, um, said. It says maybe this one moment with this one person is the very reason we're here on Earth at this time. Mm. And I just mm. really I always remember that one person, one moment, um, <clears throat> which you may never have again. So it's important uh, just to connect with people and to be able to to really um, regard them as another human and and give them your time. I, I'm, I'm reminded when you when you talk about your responsiveness to uh, whether it's a nurse stopping you in the hall or if it's a, an email or a letter or however that comes across. <clears throat> it reminds me that the we often say that the opposite of compassion is not cruelty. The opposite of compassion is judgment. And much in that same way, we talk about that the opposite of love is not hatred. 
the opposite of love is apathy. And by being responsive, that is showing that you are not apathetic about the, the needs of your nurses and being that responsive leader. Uh, I have to think that that speaks volumes to, to those that you lead. I hope so. You know, yeah. I, I hope that it's meaningful to them. And, you know, I, I try to never get in front of a crowd or, or be in a, be in any kind of setting where there are nurses that I, I consciously assess my messaging to say, is there something here that could help someone? And, you know, that's, that's always been my desire is to serve and to, and to really connect with people uh, where they are. And so that's what I love to do. It's, it's being present. It's being present. Yep. Yep. That's, that's fantastic. So, so who taught you leadership? I know you that you mentioned one of your one of your doctors in Colorado, uh, and who else taught you leadership? Wow, well, I think I I got a lot of that, um, a lot of that from my parents. You know, not necessarily that we sat down and had leadership courses, mm -hmm. but you know, just the the way that they modeled service, Marcus. It was it was a lot of service. You know. My mother was a school teacher and uh, as I said earlier, and, and she clearly served, you know, and and when when there would be um, initiatives to lead, you know, she would step up and I would watch her, you know, in in different leadership roles. And and she always did so through because to her it was serving others, you know, a lot of volunteer organizations. I watched my dad, you know, who who also would step into leadership roles when, when asked to do different things. He was the chair of the deacons in our church and, you know, different leadership roles professionally that he took on that, that really, um, you know, weren't probably weren't big deals to him, but yet, you know, he, he was, uh, he was a, a leader of, uh, he was a banker and he was the leader of one of their branches that, that the bank had. And, you know, I, I, I would listen to him talk about, you know, employees and how to how to create a good place for them to, to work and and those kind of things. So I think I, I just picked up a lot of um, both the reward that they got. They both got from from being leaders as well as um, the accountability that we have on this earth to to serve. And, and I think that that's where um, my early stages were. But I had some really good role models. Uh, in nursing, I'll, I'll never forget my early days in Colorado when I was a, a, a very inexperienced novice CNO. Um, and I remember I attached myself to Colleen Good, who was a chief nurse uh, at a hospital there in the Denver area. And uh, I just really, I learned from her. I watched her. I, I listened to her speak. And, you know, I, I just really... Um, she and I had a lot of common philosophy about nursing work environment. And so I, I found her as a wonderful role model and expert. And then I, I had another colleague, uh, Karen Kowalski, who is a, um, a, a colleague in Colorado who, who wrote a lot of books about leadership and taught leadership courses. And, you know, I would always listen to the things that she had to say, you know, about, you know, stepping up you know, really stepping up and don't hold back. And, and you're the one that, that is, is here to do this. Like, like Gene Watson's statement or like um, in the Bible where Esther, you know, this is, this is a, a, you're, you're in this role because this is the time you were born to be a leader kind of, kind of messaging. And so, you know, I, I just had some really good colleagues and role models that, that I watched along the way. And then I guess finally, I would, I would say that, um, that when I was in the PhD program at the University of Colorado, um, you know, I had, I had a lot of, I was influenced by some of the faculty, you know, as I watched them take on their own, their own research uh, programs and lead their own way, you know, kind of into the wilderness, so to speak, um, in, in the areas of research where no one else had been. And, you know, just kind of watched how, how they did that. So I've just, you know, I've been in the right place at the right time, a lot of my career. And I just owe a lot of other people uh, gratitude for, for all they've given me and all I've learned from them. 
You know, one of my students recently wrote in a paper, uh, she described herself as having a servant's heart. Yeah. A servant's heart. And that's exactly what it sounds like both of your parents had and that they also gave to you. Yeah. Uh, and I'm so glad that, that your career has has moved in so many different directions to affect so many people over the years. It's a, it's a beautiful thing to have that servant's heart and to be able to share that with, uh, with so many. Yeah. So I have a couple of rapid fire questions for you before we go today. Are you ready? I'm ready. Let's go. All right. So first question, let's say that you were stranded on a desert island and yet you can have one piece of art with you, one film or piece of visual art or a book or oh i don't care if you want to bring a an entire broadway cast to your private island you certainly can um but this is a very well appointed private uh private deserted island so much like a good hotel room you already have a bible and a uh, a Quran, if you would like, much like are in resting in the drawer of every hotel room in the country. So is there a piece of art that you would choose to bring to your desert island? Wow. You know, one of um, one of the pieces of art I have in my house um, hanging on the wall is was a gift to me uh, from a cardiologist that I worked with um, in Denver. And he was part of a group who actually traveled to Kazakhstan to do a surgery and to take care of, of heart procedures for um, individuals who had no access to uh, the specialty of cardiology. And, um, and he was an artist and he painted this picture of, um, of a Kazakhstan nurse at the bedside of one of the patients that he had cared for. And, um, you know, it's, it's just a beautiful depiction of, of a nurse. And what's special about it to me is how he depicted the nurse as being one, uh, I think she's holding the hand of the patient <coughs> and, um, and is as present at the bedside and, and is listening. And, and I think that she was probably in the course of listening, surveilling the patient to make sure everything was okay. You know, just that, that blind eye of nurses that we have uh, the ability to, to pick up things that others might miss. Um, and um, just that, that piece of art is one that, you know, on, on my, on my dark days. Now don't, don't, don't misunderstand that. Um, I've had a fabulous career. I've never had a bad year, Marcus. That every year has been wonderful. But I've had a few dark days. And on those rare dark days that I have, I, uh, I look at that picture and I'm reminded how important it is that the world have nurses and how important it is that nurses can be nurses in their world. And so, you know, that's what I focus a lot of my, my role as a nurse leader on is making sure that nurses can be nurses in our world. And that's so that's beautiful. why I love that picture because a doctor painted it and he got yeah. it. He saw the, um, the very essence of nursing um, as he painted that picture. I, I find that, that to be a beautiful thing, right? Uh, yeah. What, a, yeah. what, a great, what a great piece there you're talking about. Now I do have a statue. I'll have to show you. Mm -hmm. I've got a statue of Florence Nightingale here in my office. So that's a very precious thing too, but it's too heavy to carry to an island. It's bronze <laughs> and, and I would probably kill someone trying to get it there. So um, Florence, I'm sorry, I'd have to leave you behind, but that's pretty precious to me too. That's, um, that's great. Yeah. Good stuff. So if you could, second question for you then, if you could live for one day, as any fictional character you would like, what fictional character would you choose and why? You know, I always said if I come back in my second life, I'd want to be a country western singer. But that's not a fictional character. Let me think here for a, for a minute. A fictional character. 
Wow, that's a hard one, Marcus. Where do you come up with these questions? I don't know. <laughs> a fictional character. Oh, man, I'm thinking. You can come back as Patsy Cline or Loretta Lynn or Tammy Wynette if you'd like. I, I don't know. They're not exactly fictional, but. <laughs> no, those aren't, those aren't fictional characters. You know, I, I think that, um, hmm. You know, I, I think about some of the, the um, although I wasn't a Trekkie growing up, I think about some of the people that had an opportunity to, to, um, to explore space and to, mm. and to experience that like Dr. Spock. You know, I think that that would be a, a fun position to find yourself in where you could heal people with this advanced technology that didn't require you to cut a hole in their belly or something, you know, all of, all of those. I also was kind of think about the doctors, although they're not really characters in Star Wars and um, um, yeah, Star Wars films uh, where they actually, something happens to your hand and you just replace it, you know, or, or I could give you sight back, you know, wouldn't that be mm -hmm, wonderful mm -hmm. to be able to, to have that kind of technology where you could do that. So that's probably where my mind would go. Um, I love the future. Futuristic. Of yeah, I love the futurism there. And lastly, if you could have <clears throat> the biggest, uh, the biggest billboard on top of the highest mountain, what is the message that you would want to convey to the world? Oh, probably God is good. It's good. Probably God, God is, is good. good. You know, I, I think a lot about, you know, people sometimes ask me, what what are you the most proud of across your entire career? And you know what it is, Marcus? It's mm -hmm. having raised two successful daughters. And and I think that that is that is probably one of my greatest accomplishments. Um, you know, working full time, going to school full time, in a job that's more of a lifestyle than it is a job. And so I only have the credit uh, goes to God on on all of that because. That's nothing I did. That was me doing God's work. Beautiful, beautiful. Sharon, it has been such a pleasure. Thank you so much for taking the time to be to, with me today and, and sharing your your insight and your your experiences and your your guidance. Um, I, I believe so many people will benefit from your life experience and from your lessons. So thank you so much for being with me today. Mm -hmm. Well, that makes me very happy to say people will benefit because that's why I do these things. So, Marcus, thank you for all you do and I appreciate who you are and what you bring to nurses and uh, and very good, good opportunity to get to see you again. So thanks. Thank you. Thank you. And thank you, everyone, for tuning in today. Again, this is Compassion and <clears throat> pardon me. This is Compassion and Courage Conversations in Healthcare. Uh, this is the podcast where I teach compassionate communication, provide perspective, and inspire resilience. We'll see you next time on Compassion and Courage. Thank you.